West Point, cradle of America's military leaders, the dedication of a monument to a great fighting man, General George S. Patton. To the world, he had become a legend of valor and victory in battle. Old blood and guts, with his ivory-handled six guns and gold helmet, a symbol of the American warrior. West Point had been George Patton's goal from childhood. He entered in 1904, determined to win military glory. Only an average student in the classrooms, Patton excelled on the drill field. This was true preparation for war. The young cadet was impatient to be tried by fire. His first taste of war came in 1915, when he pursued Pancho Villa's raiders across the Mexican border. By the time of the First World War, Patton was a captain. He formed America's first tank corps and led his tanks and doughboys to victory after victory against the Germans. After the war, back to horses, although the day of the tank had arrived. Patton's pleas for the tank army were disregarded, but with a few old machines, he went ahead and worked out the doctrines of modern tank warfare. It was the Germans who first put Patton's ideas into practice. Adolf Hitler created huge panzer armies. By comparison, America's tank force was puny at the start of World War II. Newly formed, the United States Tank Corps went on maneuvers under the command of George Patton. Then, onto its first great adventure, the invasion of North Africa with Patton in command of a task force. H hour at Casablanca. Under the guns of the defenders, the first boatloads of GIs reached the beach. Patton tried to go with him, but his ship was hit by shell fire. Next day, the naval battle ended and Patton reached the shore. There, he supervised the unloading of tanks and desperately needed heavy equipment. Oblivious to personal danger, he led his troops to the conquest of North Africa. Then he took on a far bigger job, the battle for Tunisia. Into the desert rolled the tanks to meet the Germans. Although Patton's troops were green and his opponent was Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, he had no doubt that he could beat the Nazi desert fox at his own game of tank warfare. In a series of tank battles, Rommel was smashed and Patton won his nickname, All Blood and Guts. His next assignment, the invasion of Sicily. The convoy reached Sicily in July, 1943. Veterans of Tunisia started for shore under the eyes of their hard-boiled commander. Their battle order from Patton ripped the enemy up the belly and shoot him in the guts. While the fight for the beaches was still in progress, he went ashore to make certain they followed instructions. Fanning out from the beachheads, the GIs advanced against fanatic German resistance. With them went all blood and guts, scorning danger, shouting encouragement. The troops responded with a Patton-style blitzkrieg, crushing the enemy and capturing thousands. The American 7th Army swept across Sicily. But at the peak of success, an event that nearly wrecked Patton's career. It happened at an American field hospital during the last days of the Sicilian campaign, the famous slapping incident. General Eisenhower's reaction was immediate and severe. Ike and Patton were old friends, but Eisenhower didn't let that stand in the way of an investigation. Patton, he learned, had struck a psychoneurotic soldier, mistaking mental illness for cowardice. Ike was enraged. He gave Patton a choice. Apologize to your troops or resign your command. 
The troops were assembled division by division and all blood and guts apologized. Then, ready for his greatest adventure, off to London. In England, Patton trained GIs for the biggest Allied effort of the war, the invasion of France. They learned to fight Patton's way hand to hand with cold steel and without mercy. Patton told his men the shortest way home was through France. They would travel that road together. First Allied invaders reached France on D-Day, General George Patton was not among them. His brand new Third Army had been held back for the breakthrough punch, and when it struck it was invincible. Like a steel flood, Patton's tanks rolled across Normandy, cheered by the liberated French. The shattered Germans were left behind. Towns and cities welcomed the liberators as they sped through France. The drive turned into a jubilant parade. A hurried kiss, then on toward the German border, with old blood and guts close behind. He and his men reached the fortress city of Metz, and there the offensive stopped. Artillery shelled the city. Supplies of gasoline and ammunition were brought up from the rear. Patton's tanks had far outdistanced his supply trucks. Metz was taken 12 days later. The culmination of a drive that for speed and daring was almost without equal. Patton and his men were heroes. But at Metz, the Germans had taken advantage of the pause to reorganize their defenses. They struck back savagely in the Ardennes forest in December 1944. The Nazi goal was the destruction of two American armies and the isolation of the British. If they succeeded, the war might go on indefinitely. At Bastogne, the American 101st Airborne Division was trapped. Although completely surrounded, it refused to surrender. To the rescue went Patton and his tanks, undertaking a task that was thought to be impossible. The roads were choked with snow, the enemy was everywhere. Fighting their way through some of the worst terrain in Europe, the tankers broke through the Nazis and reached Bastogne. With them, sharing the privations and dangers, came their fighting commander. Once again, the impossible had been done by old blood and guts Patton. Then, a new offensive in the spring of 1945. This time, Patton led his tanks and troops into the heart of Germany. One after another, Germany's cities fell. The stage was set for Germany's unconditional surrender. B.E. Day, victory in Europe, dancing in the streets and peace. A few weeks later, Patton came home to his wife and family. With them, he could drop his swashbuckling public personality and return to the role he liked best, devoted husband and father. But very soon, the general had to leave his family. Reporting to President Truman, he was congratulated on his remarkable record of victories in Europe. Then, a series of great parades. Even more than the cheers of crowds, Patton loved the clash of battle. He had asked for a fighting assignment against Japan. Meanwhile, he made morale building public appearances. This war is only half over. And it could damn well be lost. And it is up to your people, both by your sweat and by your pocketbooks, to see that that incomparable team, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, is supported. 
until the Japanese is as completely destroyed as is the German. Thank you. But instead of Japan, Patton went back to Germany and the army of occupation. For him and his men, the real war was over. One day, the general started off on a hunting trip. Twelve months had passed since his history-making dash to the relief of Bastogne. It was an ill-fated journey. After so many encounters with death, it had come to Patton in an automobile accident. They buried him in Germany among his fallen comrades in ground he and his men had conquered. But his fame lives on, an inspiration to soldiers, a legend of blood and guts.